Good morning and welcome to our service, especially if this is your first time with us. Our text for today is, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. This beatitude is closely linked with Psalm 24, which we will read as our call to worship this morning. The earth is the Lord's, and everything in it, the world, and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas, and established it on the waters. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord, who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol, or swear by a false god. They will receive blessing from the Lord, and vindication from God their Saviour. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, God of Jacob. Let us bring our time to God in prayer. Our Father, we bring our praise to you who is Lord over all. We look around us at the world you have created, the sunrise and sunset, the spring flowers just coming into bloom, the animals and birds as they prepare for spring, and we are lost in wonder at how ordered everything is. We see how the whole of creation points to a creator and did not come about by chance. We give thanks that you have founded this world and nothing can move it. We are grateful that you are a faithful and dependable God. As we come into your holy presence this morning, we realise that our hands are not always clean or our hearts pure. There have been times when we have followed our own ways rather than yours. As we come to worship, so we seek your forgiveness for where we have gone our own way and not yours. In this time of Lent, we pray that you would help us by your Spirit to prepare our hearts. Help us to use this time to reflect upon Jesus Christ, so that we might grow more like him. Help us to piece the, together the puzzle that is our life together. May we love and support one another as you have loved us. Holy God, as we consider this morning what it means to have a pure heart, open our eyes to the splendour of your majesty. Give us a glimpse of your purity, as you did for those disciples on the mountain top. We acknowledge that only you are perfect in power, love and purity, and that there is no one besides you. This morning, we seek to join with all your works, all that you have created in praising your name, our holy, merciful and mighty God. Amen. Let us join together in singing our first hymn, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty.
merciful and mighty God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Today is taken from Luke chapter 9 and is entitled The Transfiguration. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John and James with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendour, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfilment in Jerusalem. Peter and his companion were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving Jesus, leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses and one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying. While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son, whom I have chosen to listen to him. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves and did not tell anyone at that time what they had seen. Our text this morning is Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. It's closely linked with Psalm 24, which asks the question, who can ascend the hill of the Lord? And the answer being, he who has clean hands and a pure heart. So the question is, how do we get clean hands and a pure heart? As we think about being pure or holy or clean, whatever term we want to use, then we also think about cleaning agents, don't we? I have a selection here for us to, uh, of different cleaning agents for, that are used for different things. We have some soap, bleach, toilet duck, good old bathroom cleaner, uh, washing machine capsules for those who are into washing, washing clothes and that sort of thing, uh, some shampoo, I uh, had a nosebleed last night, so I've got some blood here just to, uh, um, for, uh, 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 for that. And we also got um, fire. Julian's pleased with that. You know, likes playing with fire. Now then, what do you use these different cleaning agents for? If I want to clean my hands, what are these things would I use? What am I going to use to clean my hands with? You're used to doing this by now, after all this time, a year of uh, cleaning hands, you know what to do. So what do I use? Yep, I'm going to use the soap. Put a squirt on my hands and rub them together, run them under some water. Yeah, you know the, the rigmarole, you know, getting in the, all the things, don't forget your thumbs. You use soap to wash your hands. Now, would I use that to clean my clothes? Well, some people might, but no. You'd use one of those. Put that in your washing machine, put your clothes in, washing powder or a washing capsule, that's what you'd use, isn't it? Now, sometimes dishcloths get dirty, especially if they're being used for cleaning the floor. You wouldn't want to go and then wash up with your dishcloth after that, would you? So, what are you going to use? What are you going to use to clean your dishcloth to get rid of the dirt that's... Uh, well, you could always burn it, I suppose. Uh, you've got shampoo, bathroom cleaner. That's what Julian often uses, some bleach. You'll put some bleach in the water, put, some di put the dishcloth in, and hey presto, it comes up nice and clean kills off all the germs and you can use it as a, as a, uh, a dishcloth again. But would you use that 
to clean your bathroom. What are you going to use to clean your bathroom? Well, it says bathroom cleaner on it, so I assume that is what you use for cleaning bathrooms. Don't ask me, but uh, that's apparently what you use for cleaning bathrooms. Bathroom cleaner. But if it cleans bathrooms, does it also do toilets? Probably not. You probably want something a little bit stronger, wouldn't you? There you go. You've got your toilet duck for cleaning your uh, bathroom. For, or cleaning your toilet, at least, in your bathroom. But would I use that for washing my hair? I'm not sure that I'd use that for brushing my hair. I think we're into shampoo. So... We've got lots of cleaning agents, lots of different things that are appropriate for certain tasks. We come back to our question, how then do we have clean hands and a pure heart? Well, we need to wash these things in something. And it's tempting to think that soap will clean our hands, which it does, of course. But you can't use it on our hearts, can we? And the kind of clean hands that the Bible is uh, talking about here is not hands that have been washed with soap, but our spiritual hands. In other words, the deeds that we have done. Just as you can't get dirty hands, just as you can get dirty hands from touching dirty things, so we get spiritually dirty hands from touching and doing things that are wrong. Now there are two things here that the Bible talks about as cleaning agents both of which we tend not to think about in that way. The first we can relate to more readily, and that is fire. Ah. Yep, fire. What does fire do? Fire refines. To refine metals like silver and gold, you use fire. It allows you to melt the metal, take off any impurities, or dross as they're called, and end up with a purer form of the metal. God uses the symbolism of fire in refining us. Sometimes the problems we go through in life are linked with God's fire and him getting rid of the dross out of our lives. No, it's not necessarily a pleasant, pleasant pro process at the time, but it le uh, yields lives of great worth. Now, the other cleaning agent the Bible talks about is blood. Now, normally when we think of blood, it's something that stains, isn't it? Parents, how many of you have tried to get blood out of clothes? Tried to get blood out of, or dried blood out of clothes? It doesn't happen, does it? I put my finger in it just now and it's still stained. Blood we think of as staining things. But the Bible tells us that the blood of Jesus Christ his Son purifies us from all sin. The blood of Jesus Christ is able to deal with the problem of a dirty heart. None of these other cleaning agents work. Nothing can clean the heart except the blood of Jesus Christ. And nothing is more effective at cleaning than the blood of Jesus Christ. All these other agents leave traces of impurity. But the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses completely and utterly, removing all sin. Yes, we may still go on to sin, which is why we have to keep our hands clean. But the heart is made clean and so when we trust in Jesus Christ as our Saviour. And so it allows us to see God, allows us to ascend the hill of the Lord. Have you been washed in the blood of the Lamb, as the, the hymn writer puts it? Do we know sins forgiven because we've trusted in Jesus Christ and the blood that he shed for us at Calvary? Amen. Good morning. Many folk in Broughton will remember the time that Peter Pilavacci spent with us as a minister in training. He was dividing his time between Regents College, Oxford, Broughton Baptist Church and his family. We first met Peter seven years ago and he first preached here 
in May 2014, going on to formally join us in September of that year as our minister in training. Well, Peter faced a, <clears throat> a bit of a culture shock coming here as he had always lived and worshipped in towns and cities, but he soon adjusted and enjoyed discovering things, often to his surprise, that worked in a village setting. Having completed his ministerial training, his time with us came to an end in June 2017. But he must have enjoyed his newfound village life because a good number of us were able to travel to the village of Thaden Boyce, which lies just inside the M25 near Epping Forest, and go there for his induction as pastor at Thaden Boyce Baptist Church in September of that year, 2017. Well, Peter tells us that he remembers his time here with great fondness, recalling our passion and energy for the Lord's work and how much he learned whilst with us. He too was excited when Alistair joined us and to see how we have responded to the present restrictions with all that's being streamed, praying for the impact and blessing of our outreach. Peter has given us six prayer points which I can summarise as follows. Education of young people, opening up of the churches, ministers and church leaders, church meetings, local communities and listening to God on into the future. So let's now bring these to God in prayer as we lift up the work in Thaden Boys. But as we do so, let us echo in our own hearts our commitment and prayers for our minister, our church and communities as well. Let's pray. Loving God and Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are able to respond to the prayers of your people, that you are the final authority in all things and that nothing stands in the way of your will and purpose. We bring to you these requests in prayer this morning as we lift up all the young people in education from primary to university and beyond and we especially lift up Emily Pilavacci at Portsmouth University and her brother Andrew and his plans to go there next year. Lord, we thank you for the time that Peter spent with us and for the privilege of being involved in enabling one you have called into the ministry. We pray for both our churches that as thoughts turn to opening up for physical meetings, both on Sundays and during the week, that it can be done safely and responsibly. We pray for ministers and church leaders. We pray particularly for Peter, for new ways to be made clear during lockdown to enable effective service and ministry to both the church and community, for guidance, wisdom and discernment from the Holy Spirit in moving forward. Lord, we thank you for enabling and equipping, equipping your people to enable things to continue through the streaming services and the Zoom meetings. And as these continue and the physical meetings begin again, be with Peter and Thaden Boys Baptist Church and guide them through all the difficulties that these changes may bring, especially to those directly involved. Lord, we lift up to you the community they serve, which has gone through many and varied troubles. Lord, we know that you see every detail, and so we pray that you would enable them to support and care for those people in the months ahead, keeping their eyes and ears firmly focused and listening to you, Lord, as to how, about, how they go about your work. And finally, Lord, we pray for them as they hold a time of prayer and fasting 
in the first week of March, to seek to listen more clearly to you, Lord, and thus be guided as to the future shape of your church there. Hear our prayers, we pray, for your honour and glory, in Jesus' name. Amen. So we come to our next hymn. It was written in the 1860s and is absolutely full of wonderful scriptural truths. It was revived in its use when the current tune was written in 1997. And we hope that you can join together and sing both this hymn and also rejoice in the knowledge of these truths for yourself. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong, a perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. I have a strong and perfect plea A great high priest whose name is love Whoever lives and pleads for me My name is graven on his hands My name is written on his heart I know that while in heaven he stands no tongue can bid me thence depart No tongue can bid me thence depart When Satan tempts me to despair And tells me of the guilt within Upward I look and see him there Who made an end to all my sin Because the sinless Savior died My sinful soul is counted free For God the just is satisfied To look on him Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. We have considered the connection between Psalm 24 and the question asked there, Who can ascend the hill of the Lord? He who has a pure heart is the reply. But what does it mean to be pure? When we talk about being pure, or purity, or holiness, there are several illustrations that come to mind. There are the washing adverts, aren't there, that claim to get all the dirt out, leaving your washing clean without a stain, even under a spotlight, allegedly. When it comes to precious metals, there is a scale that shows their purity. 
an 18 karat gold ring is only 75% gold, so still has some impurities in it. Even at 24 karat, gold may not be completely pure. Now how can I tell if my heart is pure? There is no spotlight you can put it under, no assay test to undergo. Even judging by moral standards is difficult, as these can change over time. And how do I decide what is the right standard? Even in evangelical circles, standards change. I was listening to someone the other day who commented on how standards have changed. When they were young, it would not be uncommon for someone to come out of church and light up a cigarette. But they would not darken the doors of a pub. These days, it would be frowned upon to smoke, but perfectly acceptable to go to the pub for Sunday lunch. Our standards change, so how do we know if our hearts are pure? We will come back to this question later. The other question this verse raises is this. Why is it important to see the face of God? Throughout the Bible, one of the metaphors used for knowing that God was with us was that his face was turned, turned towards us. In the priestly blessing in number six, there is the request that God turn his face towards the people so that they would know his peace and blessing. The opposite is also true. The psalmist often pleads with God saying, do not hide your face from me. To know God's face is turned towards us means that he is pleased with us. It was Moses who had the desire to see God. It is recorded that Moses spoke with God face to face. But Moses did not actually see God. God tells Moses that it is impossible to see God and live. Because God is so holy and pure, we are not able to behold his glory. Even when Moses saw the back of God as he passed by, it was too much for him. Those who have seen God in visions recount that his, his splendour caused them to become like dead men. Isaiah, Ezekiel and John, in their visions of God, all fell at his feet as though dead. What is so important about seeing the face of God? And why should I keep my ways pure? It is because to see God's face or have his face turned towards us means that we will know the blessing of God. We will know his peace in our hearts and in our lives. It means that we have received the grace of God which has brought us into his presence. Looking at it the other way round, to have his face turned away from us means that we cannot come into his presence that we do not know true peace, and we live under a curse rather than a blessing, and that ends in death. As we go through the Bible, especially the Old Testament, we discover the importance of seeking and seeing the face of God. It is a matter of life and death. It is the difference between being blessed and being cursed. So, being able to see God is very important. Which brings us back to the question of how do I know if I've got a pure heart? I'm fairly certain that the Lord Jesus had in mind this Psalm 24 when he gave this beatitude. There are verses of the Bible that come readily to mind as they pick up on having the pure heart. But the Psalm also talks about having clean hands. Now there is another scripture that is linked with this beatitude and that is Matthew 15 and the Pharisees complaining that the disciples had not washed their hands when they came to eat. This is a very topical subject at the moment. One of the government's strap lines is to wash your hands. We are used to the idea of washing our hands after going to the toilet. Now we are encouraged to wash our hands when we come home, after doing the shopping, after touching something that someone else has touched, even in coming into church, there is the uh, wash there so that we can wash our hands as we come in. Why this emphasis on hand washing? It is to make sure 
that our hearts, are, to make sure that our hands are clean and that we don't spread germs. It is to control infection and kill off any harmful bacteria that we may have picked up. The Pharisees were concerned about being pure, of doing the right thing and maintaining a right relationship with God. This beatitude and the psalm are not so much concerned with the cleanliness of our hands, but the purity of our hearts. And this is where the Pharisees fell down. They were concerned with their outward appearance and not the inward. Having a pure heart. In a lot of ways, it is much easier to keep the rituals, the hand washing, than it is to keep our hearts pure. We can't wash our hands in the same way we can our hand. We can't wash our hearts in the same way we can our hands. And no one sees our hearts in the way they do our hands. And I find it easier to be a Pharisee, to reduce the gospel to a box ticking exercise. I do this, but I don't do that. Therefore, I'm right with God. I read my Bible, pray and go to church. I help the poor, don't swear and, get, and I don't get drunk. But it is possible to keep our hands clean and have hearts that are far from God. Do notice the Lord Jesus drops any mention of hands here. And it just talks about the heart. Having a pure heart, a heart that is in tune with God, a heart that is in tune with God, that it surrenders its will to the Father. What comes to mind when we think of purity? Pure light comes to my mind. In our Bible passage, we see something of the purity of the heart of Christ, a heart completely in tune with the Father. The Lord Jesus starts to pray, and as he prayed, so his clothes glowed and his face shone. This was brighter than any washing powder can get them. And heaven comes to earth as Moses and Elijah come and talk with Jesus Christ. And what was their conversation? Well, it certainly wasn't about the weather as Jesus wasn't British. It was about his departure, his death. Blessed are the pure in heart those who walk with God, even when it means treading a path we would rather not take. I don't know about you, but I am one for a comfortable life. This purity of heart, this walking the uncomfortable path with God disturbs me. I shy away from it because I think I see what I will miss in this life. The glory of heaven and what will be finds it hard to break into my desire-driven, self-centred present. The purity of God, surrendering to his will, scares me, just as it did those disciples. The dazzling brilliance of the glory of God and the sound of his voice scare even the most ardent disciples. Even John, Having experienced this on the mountain, still falls at the feet of Jesus Christ as though dead in the book of Revelation. The light of God's face, the light of his presence, causes me to shy away, causes us to hide, for it highlights all that is wrong in my life and our lives. It shows up all those marks that cause embarrassment. It makes visible my hardness of heart, my impure heart, a heart that keeps choosing to go my way rather than God's. It is here that I find the most remarkable thing, that cleansing agent of the blood of Christ that makes me right with God. It allows me to come into the presence of the Father. All of my rebellion and choosing my way instead of God's is dealt with. Because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, I am able to stand free of any condemnation in the pure and holy presence of God. My heart is made pure. Isaiah, when shown the glory of God, said, Woe is me! God took a burning coal, touched his lips and purified him. Yes, there is the continual purifying process in this life, but the blood of Christ cleanses our hearts and makes us right with God. When we come to God in true repentance, we are justified, 
made just as if we'd never sinned. This is more than a pronouncement. It is an act of grace that makes us a new creation. What does it mean to have a pure heart? It means that we have repented or said sorry for our sin. Our hearts have been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, who made atonement for us by dying in our place. It means that we have surrendered our lives to God and have his spirit living within us. Yes, we still battle with our self-will, but the orientation of our lives has changed. We are now looking towards God as his face is turned towards us. And one day we will see him face to face. Amen. Our final song this morning is a prayer asking God to refine us, to make us holy or pure. Let us sing together, Refiner's Fire. Thank you for having joined with us. We hope you've enjoyed this time of worship. We'll be back again, same time, same place next week, when it will be a family service. Come along and find out what food we are going to use as an illustration uh, next week. 
If this morning has brought any questions to mind, you can contact me at pastor.bbc5 at gmail.com. You can also stay in touch on our Facebook page uh, our Twitter account. There will be a time of chat on Zoom following this service, a link to which is in the email sent out earlier, on our Facebook page and on in the chat box. We end then with a blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Yeah.